إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Alhamdulillah, today is the 8th of Muharram, going into the 9th of Muharram, 1439. Before beginning, I just want to remind myself and yourselves of trying to get reward for fasting in the month of Muharram. If someone is able and eligible, you should try to fast the 9th and the 10th or the 10th and the 11th to maximize the reward of fasting. As we know from the hadith of Al-Bukhari in his Sahih, when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived in al Medina, he found the children of Israel fasting and he said, of what reason do you fast today? They said, it is Ashura. And is the day in which we were freed from Egypt. He said, we have more right to fast on this day than you. The Ashura representing the, children, the freedom of the children of Israel from Egypt. The children of Israel know of this day as Pesach. Which was corrupted and translated into English as Passover. Pesach is an important day of remembrance for the children of Israel. And once every 70 years, Passover and Ramadan coincide. They fall within the same year and around the same time with each other every 70 years. So for us to try to get reward in thanksgiving that Allah sent his prophet, Nabi Musa alayhi salam, and the children of Israel were freed. And initially there were a lot of believers among them. And they were freed from the Pharaoh and those in that time. The hadith also runs that someone who fasts has the remission and expiation of sins for the year to come after that. So it's a tremendous reward if someone can do so. It's only two days. So try to get this reward if you can. Finally, in closing the introduction, There are increasingly among the believers of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, or in English its counterpart, Muslim Orthodoxy, there are an increasing number of believers who are delving further and further into reenactment of another event that happened on the 10th of Muharram, which is the martyrdom of Sayyidina Hussein. Sayyid al-Shuhada, the grandson of the Prophet where people are getting heavily involved in reenactments, um, sometimes scourging themselves or uh, depriving themselves of uh, the comforts of their homes and things such as this because they believe they're somehow sharing in the struggles of Ahlul Bayt and so forth. My only warning is to beware of innovation. Because this is not among our customs, the mat'am ritual of striking oneself on one shoulder in the back and the mat'am and the huzn on these days, this is not from our customs. This is from the people of Shia and whether we're talking seveners, twelvers, whether the twelvers are akhbari or usuli, Dawoodi buharas or just Dawoodis or buharis, this is not to do with us. And we have to resist all these type of innovations because it's harmful. With that being said, inshallah, we're going to look at now our second presentation on the Yajuj and Majuj. Now, so far from our introduction and the first lecture, we've been able to establish the following points about Yajuj and Majuj. Yajuj and Majuj are not Gog and Magog, which refers to Russia. 
we showed this from the Muslim and Jewish scholars that there was a clear distinction between these people. Yet Juj and Majuj, secondly, are Turkish tribes. They've been prophesied before the end of time, and they are more than the Arabs can count. They are a numerous people to the point that they are more than the other peoples around them. Thirdly, their corruption in the land was such that people around them were terrified. So the Yetjuj and Majuj caused the harm of other people around them and had them fear for their personal safety. Dhulqarnain, as the fourth point, was sought, and he was a king bearing the name as Sa'ab ibn al Hadith, who was from the Himyar people of Yemen or the Al-Arab Al-Ariba, the original Arabs, before Nabiuna Ismail alayhi salam. He traveled the earth and encountered the peoples that needed help, and he built the wall and sealed it as a dam would over water. And it's, it's significant because the word Radam, and in one narration, Ridam, is used for their wall. And Ridam in Arabic means wall, but more appropriately, it means dam. So the fact that that connection was made that the Yejuj and Majuj were sealed behind a dam like they were a, uh, they were a rushing current or a fast flowing water. That tells you something about how numerous they are that it took a dam to hold back Yejuj and Majuj. The fifth point is that the lands of Yejuj and Majuj are the Turkic lands and the Great Wall of China is not their dam or wall. Rather, their barrier would later be added to and included into the Great Wall of China. So it has to be understood then that the Great Wall of China isn't the dam of the Yejuj and Majuj, although it wound up being part of it. We need to understand that the Great Wall of China isn't one contiguous wall by itself. Gradually, it became a contiguous wall. But the sections of the Great Wall of China were built over a long period of time from 270 BC onwards. It was never one contigu contiguous wall. It was built over time, destroyed. Another ruler would build another piece on, gradually put together. And then as we got hundreds of years ago, it started to be gathered together, brought together, and then eventually incorporated into one large body. But the Great Wall of China itself is not the dam of Yajuj and Majuj. Number six, the barrier or dam of Yajuj and Majuj was not only high like the wall, but also was dug under and placed there to such a degree that the two tribes would not be able to get above, burrow under, or tunnel through until the nearness of the end of times. So this wall was designed that was built 4,000 years ago to keep yet Juj and Majuj at bay. But Dhulqarnain knew that it would not be permanent because as we went over the ayat, he said, the day that it will be made to be no more. It will be as nothing. So we clearly understood that this would only be a fail-safe mechanism that would last for a period of time. Soon, this wall would be no more. And then finally, of the seven, the seventh point, the two tribes of Yajuj and Majuj are Turkic, and other Turks like them include the Tatar, later known as the Mon Mongols, or later it was shortened down to Mughal, the Huns, and many others. They are 22 tribes, but the 21st were those sealed outside of the wall, right? So you have one of the tribes, or the 22nd, excuse me, was the one that was sealed outside. So the 21 are on the other side, the 22nd is on the outside of the wall, right, as we explained. Now, these are the most important points that we've learned so far. Now, in this lesson, I want us to consider four points. And a fifth point, which I, I just thought of today that we added on which we'll come to. But the initial four points as we were going through the, as I was going through the week are the following, but there's a bonus point, I suppose I'd call it. The first point is 
What brought about Vulkaranein's construction of the dam or wall? And who were the people that asked for his help? So why was this important? What brought this about? What's the significance of this? And why would he be asked for help? We know that he traveled a substantial portion of the globe. Why would he be asked for help? Number two, has anyone ever seen the wall or dam of Yet Juju Met Juj? I remember some time ago, someone sending me the link of a video of a man who said that one of the reasons why he apostated from Islam is because he couldn't find the wall or dam of Yet Juju Met Juj. That he went to Google Maps and he searched long and hard for many months. And when failing to find it, gave up his faith. This shows not only a mental, that there are mental problems at work, but also shows a lack of thoroughness in researching the history of these matters. It wouldn't have been that hard at all to say, Let's find the history of this wall. Let's do some digging. Let's try to research into this. He just assumed the English language is the be all and end all of all things. That's the language of the gods. And if it's not in there, must not be anywhere else either. And this is the wrong type of thinking, as we've already mentioned numerous times. Number three, the dam or wall of Yajuj and Majuj is routinely attacked by them. So every day, Yajuj and Majuj are attacking that wall. They're burrowing. They're doing things to it. They're demolishing. They're doing things to that wall. Whatever section, whatever barrier it is that's affecting them, they're doing things to this wall. Number four. Has the wall been breached and have Yajuj and Majuj exited? Which is the next question. Because, again, we already discussed before that there are people claiming that Yajuj and Majuj are Gog and Magog. Some have said it's the English. Some have said it's the Jews living in Israel. Some have said it's many different things and neither of these things are correct. And part of the false reasoning that we have to get past is whether or not Yajuj and Majuj have exited. The fifth and final point, which I later added, but wasn't on this list. The fifth and final point is uh, people will be making Hajj while yet Juj and Majuj are in the earth. That's the fifth point. People will be making Hajj while yet Juj and Majuj are in the earth. This is the fifth point. And I think it's important to keep in mind because we have every reason. To understand if yet Juj and Majuj are in the earth and people are still making Hajj and Umrah, that means that the world is not disrupted to the point that it can't function. So they're going to cause corruption, but not so much that some people have put, across, put it across as if yet Juj and Majuj are somehow going to change the equilibrium of the planet and everything. It's not going to be like that at all. The fact that there'll still be Muslims able to make Hajj and Umrah is significant because it shows that much of human activity will still continue. Much of it. So, let us now look at our first portion of our five parts. Our first part is, what brought about Dhulqarnain's construction of the dam and who were the people that asked for his help? Right. So, Imam Muhammad al tabakh who died 1307, Rahimahullah, he said the following, quote, So the people that were in distress called Dhulqarnain to place between themselves and the Yajuj and Majuj barrier so that it would prevent them from one another. This would keep the two tribes from going into lands besides their own and committing corruption and destruction. The people declared that they would give him a reward or wage from their own wealth for completing this huge task. Dhulqarnain, in response to their statement, declared the following. Dhulqarnain replied, How my Lord has established me in the land is better than that which is offered. Surah Al-Kahf, the 18th Surah, Ayah 95. 
So what he made for him and established in terms of wealth and dominion is better than that which you have subjected and given to me of wealth and wage, and he has no need of it. This alone proves the might of Lulkarnain as well as the power of his dominion. And he also admits to Allah his slavehood and that all dominion and power are from Allah, exalted be he and his favors. He also showed that he is not in need of their assistance with wealth. Instead, he told them that he required their help with men, tools, and other implements. As he said to them, And assist me with strength of hands so that I might put a barrier between you and these people. The same surah, the said surah, ayah 95. So he had requested them of the action of assistance with implements and other matters in order to make between them and yet juj and Metjuj a barrier. Close quote. So we understand then that, so the people come to him and they offer him, please do this for us and we will give you a certain amount of wealth. Vulkarnain says, I don't need your wealth. Because he's one of the four great kings, as we mentioned, as we know of the Ahadith, that ruled over substantial portions of the world. He doesn't need their wealth. But instead, he says, the, only, the one thing I do need from you is assistance to build this, this dam to keep these people back. So bring me plenty of people to assist in making the barrier, assisting with the materials, gathering them together. And then creating a working environment where we can construct the wall. But I don't need money. So he goes into his own wealth to pay for the materials of what would become this massive structure. Right. So the Imam carries back. He says, quote, he carries on. He says, quote, Dhulqarnain rectified their affairs by assisting them in their statement Put some boundary between ourselves and them, will you not? Surah Al-Kahf, the 18th Surah, 95. So the wall is a barrier, a fortification a boundary, a solid barrier, and it is bigger than the Great Wall and more sturdy. This was greater and better than what they could have hoped for in the matter. Dhulqarnain said to the people, Give me copper and iron so that I might heat them. He then went to the place between the two mountains and said, Now let this be heated and blown upon. When it was molten and hot, he said, Let us go in order so that I might pour over it more molten. Surah Al-Kahf, the 18th Surah, Ayah 96. Close quote. Now, let's, us, let's understand this then. The Arabic of this Ayah mentions the word Zubar. Something's being heated, Zubar. Now, when you heat copper, at a higher temperature, copper becomes bronze. And the word Zubar is being used. So give me copper and iron so that I might heat them. So what's he doing? He's heating copper so that what happens? It becomes bronze. And he's heating iron so that it becomes what? Steel. When you heat iron to extremely high temperatures, it becomes steel. When you heat copper to extreme temperatures, it becomes bronze. Now, this makes sense because Vilkarnain's living in what? What the Kufar call the Bronze Age. Now the Kufar, why do they call things the Bronze Age? Well, the Kufar, because they're archeologists, I say they're because our, our scholars have a different way of labeling epochs. Because they're scholars, if we can call them as such, and we'll be generous, 
because their scholars will look at the implements that are being used, what they're uncovering. So let's say they come across a site where all the tools are flint and stone. They will say, okay, all the people living in this area were in the Stone Age. So it gets referred to as that because that's the majority of what they found. That doesn't necessarily mean that's all there was there. But because of that, they call that the Stone Age. Then when they discover a whole bunch of bronze and they find bronze amulets, bronze bells. You had people in China making massive bells for the monasteries out of bronze so they're superheating copper. They called that the Bronze Age. When they found out the people were, when they found certain peoples that had exorbitant amounts of iron, started calling that the Iron Age, right? And then just recently, we'd come out of what? The Industrial Age, where you started getting machines to do everything for you, right? Then there was the Space Age, right? So the Industrial Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Stone Age, these are all based upon what they found of a group of people and then what they found, they make the assumption that that must have been the most important material during that time, and that characterized that age. So they named the age after that, Bronze Age, Stone Age, all these other things. You see, we use these things, sometimes, some of, sometimes we use these expressions without even thinking about them, not realizing that there's an intellectual and also there's a wider social construct behind the use of these expressions. When you say you're bombing people back into the Stone Age or everything else, well, why not bomb them back into the Bronze Age? Why not bomb them back into the Iron Age? Why the Stone Age? Because the Stone Age is perceived as supposed to be the most, the Stone Age is perceived to be the most primitive and low level of what the human race is. I'll leave you with this before returning to the text. Really? If that's the case, the pyramids, the Great Pyramid in Cheops and others, some have said is between five and 6,000 years old. What age does that make it? Makes it before the Bronze Age, makes it Stone Age. I thought Stone Age was supposed to be primitive man. Babylon, the oldest civilization, Babylon, Sumer, all that Stone Age. So what do we mean by this? The remains that exist in South America where you find big, massive, beveled blocks, quirk, you find massive quarrying blocks that have a serrated edge as if they've been cut with a, with a sword or a drill bit. That's thousands of years ago in the Stone Age. But these ideas and concepts are taught in school as facts. And then they're put in media and the media are, are the same people controlling the media, the same people controlling what we're calling education. And then it's also in popular music and radio. So to overcome this, you have to completely deprogram and whittle yourself down and destroy all these systems. And what you teach your children has to be from the very beginning. Otherwise, you're just making clones of you. Which is part of the reason why we're, why we're in some of the mess we're in. Because we keep making the same clones. We keep making the same broken people over and over again. Then we lose wars that we should never lose. Get held back in ways that we should never get held back. And then we blame the Jews. So we have to start to think intelligently about these matters. So Volkar Nain's living 4,000 years ago. And he's heating copper and iron to make bronze and steel. Right? So... <coughs> Imam at the Bach, he goes on to say, quote, This great and mighty work was carried out under the orders of Lukarnain, with the rest of the tools and implements of stone, wood, and so forth. The wall was not just liquid, but was large blocks that would be put between the two mountains, and this was copper that was heated in the first part of the job. Abu Sa'ud said, The digging, according to historical accounts, continued. And they dug downwards until they reached water. And the foundations of the wall were placed there and made of rock 
and heated copper. The overground portion of the wall was from iron and steel that had been put with wood and pitch so that it was a barrier between the two mountains. At its highest point, it reached on for some 100 farsakh in one direction. Its elevation was 200 hands and its width was 50 hands. Its visible structure could be seen that it was a fortified rock and the blocks were stacked on top of each other and reinforced with iron and copper to act as bonding agents so that there remained no holes at all in the base or the top. Instead of the usual mortar, these two things were used. Ibn Kathir remarked, It was built just as a law set of iron and copper, but the copper was heated, and the iron was heated, and the mortar for the bricks was replaced with iron, and the clay was replaced for copper that was heated. This large and enormous wall was manifest, and the world had not known a more noble wall than, than it. And there was no more beneficial thing for the creation than that wall for its time. Close quote. So understand then. So this wall is stretching on for 100 farsakh in one direction. Let's put this in perspective then. 48 miles is 16 farsakh. I'll say this again. 48 miles is 16 farsakh. So if the wall in one direction is stretching 100 farsakh, that gives you a sense of how long the wall is stretching. All right? Now, someone could say, well, how could that be? That seems... Fantastic, that doesn't seem possible, that doesn't seem within reason, that doesn't seem possible, that, doesn't, that just doesn't make any sense. My answer to such a doubt would be to say, forget this wall for a second, this barrier. The Great Wall of China extends from the sea next to China all the way inland northward and then juts down southward. Now that wall is extremely large and with binoculars can be seen in low earth orbit as has been evidenced by people in space stations and other uh, low lying uh, objects that they're riding in. You can't see it with the naked eye, but you can see it with binoculars if you're in low Earth orbit and you have perfect conditions on the day. That's an enormous wall. It's extremely long. As for people claiming that you could see the wall from the moon or what have you, we have no report of that. Um, you would have to have vision. Your, your vision would have to be 17,000 times greater than your normal 2020 vision to see that. Now, there are Muslim brothers here with great vision. But no one that I know yet with 17,000 times 2020 vision. Not yet, unless they haven't said anything today. So the Great Wall of China is an enormous structure. Now, it's greater than the length of what we're hearing about the dam that's supposed to hold back this area. And the interesting thing about the Great Wall of China is that there are sections of it when you listen to historians discuss, and I will give you some uh, historical notes in a moment, when you listen to historians discuss the Wall of China, because the Great Wall is actually a series of several walls that over time were incorporated into one whole, when you listen to historians mention it, they mention rock, bronze, steel, wood, and other things. And they say the wall is constructed out of the same materials, the soil that's around it. There are parts of it that are black in color or grayish. And then it's red on the other side because the soil was used there. It was packed in. It had mortar used in place of this, in place of that. So people understand that something's there. Something's going on there. This is the Great Wall of China. Now, to understand more about the Great Wall of China, 
it's long term. There's a few books that I accessed at the library that would be useful for you. One is by Arthur Waldron, W-A-L-D-R-O-N, Arthur Waldron. This is called The Problem of the Great Wall of China. Arthur Waldron, The Problem of the Great Wall of China. This was published in 1983. And it was quoted in the Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies. The Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies. So Arthur Waldron, 1983, The Problem of the Great Wall of China. Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies. Volume 43. This is over 40 of over 40 volume study on the Great Wall of China, its history, everything else. So volume 43 is just one of them. I got all by the same author. You have the Great Wall Myth. This is from 1988. The Great Wall Myth. Its origins and role in modern China. The Great Wall Myth, its origin, its origins and role in modern China. That's 1988. That was an interlibrary loan I had to do for both of these. Then the third one, same author. The Great Wall of China. From History to Myth. I want to give you two other quotes. One that's interlinear Spanish with English. Um, but you can find just the English one. This is by a Carlos Rojas. Rojas is R-O-J-A-S. Rojas. Carlos Rojas. This was published 2010. It is entitled The Great Wall, A Cultural History. The Great Wall, A Cultural History. And then the final one I want to give this is by a Tammy Evans, T-H-A-M-M-Y, Evans, E-V-A-N-S, and it's called Great Wall of China, Beijing and Northern China, Beijing and Northern China. That was published 2006. Tammy Evans, Great Wall of China, Beijing and Northern China. So these are some things that will give you a very expansive account of the Great Wall of China, its enormous size. The Chinese didn't, don't tend to call it the Great Wall of China because to them they see it as a series of walls that have been put together because the Great Wall of China wasn't built in one time. The first wall built that would later be incorporated in the Great Wall of China was built in 227 B.C. That's the first time a fortification was built to keep invaders out. Every other wall has been added on or later incorporated at that time. That's another reason why we know that the dam of Yejuj and Mejuj can't be the Great Wall of China. Because the construction on what would become the Great Wall of China began in 227 BC. Zulkarnain lived when? He lived, he lived 4,000 years ago. Way before that, 2000 BC. So that dam was there before the Great Wall. So that can't be the case. But over time, as these walls and barriers get included, everything was made just one contiguous wall. So in the 1890s, uh, the unbelievers from England and the United States started using the expression Great Wall of China and just stuck. 
right? The hot, some people in Holland say the Chinese wall, because Chinese have big walls, so it's called the Chinese wall. The Chinese, they don't have that expression, right? So it's just important to understand that this isn't the only big wall. Now, for our second point, has anyone ever seen the wall or dam of Yejuj and Mejuj? Because this, this question is significant because if something has that type of girth, it's a hundred farosach in one direction, stretching between two mountains. And one and 16 farosach is 48 miles. A hundred, that's an enormous amount of miles. Someone had to have seen it. Someone had to have witnessed it. Someone had to have at least come across it. At least have come across it. So, this is part of what we want to discuss. So, there are many people who have asked, is there a way that we can see if the wall is still standing? And has it remained with us down to this day? Knowing the location helps us understand the locale of the Ajuj and Majuj people and how far they are we are from the end of days. Now, we've already discussed in the last presentation that we did the location of the Turkic peoples in relation to the other nations around them and everything else. I'm going to give you some quotes that are significant that are useful. One of them is by the historian Yaqut. By the historian Yaqut. Yaqut lived the better part of 1200 or so years ago. Yaqut. In his book Mu'jab al-Buldan, volume 5, page 112. He says, under the chapter on heady discussion, and the belief in the, narr in the narrations given about the kings of Yemen, he says, quote, Now understand, when Nashur Yun'am died, the king, the one who took over after him, his name was Shamar ibn Ifriqis, ibn Abraha. He gathered his armies, and he had as many as 500,000 men. And he carried on until he reached Iraq. And he took obedience from them because they knew there was no way to defeat him. On account of the large amount of his armies, his power, and his dominion. Shemur then traveled out and intended to make it to China. To see the wall that his ancestors had mentioned previously. But he died while on the way of thirst. And no news came from those who went with him. He died along the way while others continued to advance. But it would not be except the few that would make it to the area known as Samarqand. While there they found ruins. And they built up some of the ruins and they stayed there for a period of time. And they left these ruins after rebuilding them and restored them until they were better than how they had been before. They then came to an open land, a large expanse. And they encountered some people that they had not seen before. This is while they were on the way to China. Those people beset them. They were killed. Some of them were taken prisoner and others were burned. Those surviving escaped back to Yemen and told narratives 
of a fantastic tale that they had encountered while in that land. They said that when they reached the river Jihon and they passed the city of Bukhara they came to a city called Samarqand that was ruins and they built it up and refurbished it and they carried on in the direction of China but they reached the land of the Turks in a month and it was a wide open land with much water but a foul odor and smell coming from there with. They were besieged in this great city. And they were held back and they were not able to make their way to China on account of the large amount of people that set upon them. They saw a large body of people and on the other side of them an expansive wall. And it's at that point that they knew they could go no further. So they decided to use the way along, some, along Khorasan to make their way back. And they made their way back having not reached into the inner, into the inner sanctum of China or Sijistan. Both quote. So that's telling you that they saw the barrier. This is 1,200 years ago. Uh, he wrote this, and he's writing about kings coming after Abraha's time because Yemen was ruled by the Ethiopians. So this is before the time of the Prophet Wasallam. People are seeing this grand wall and seeing these things. They're seeing these events taking place. Now, we also have the Arabs encountering this wall in the time of the Prophet So we want to talk about this. A man said to the Prophet I have seen the wall. The reply was, how did it look exactly? The man said, it is a dark colored, iron in appearance structure. The Prophet said, Indeed, you have seen it. This is collected by Imam Bukhari in Al-Jami' al-Sahih, the book of the prophets, under the chapter of the narrative of Yajuj Majuj. Imam Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Jarid al-Tabri, who died 280, rahimahullah, he said the following, quote, It was narrated to us by Bishr, who narrated to us by Yazid, who narrated to us by Sa'id, who narrated to us by Qatada, who said, it was mentioned to us that a man came and said, Messenger of Allah, I have seen the wall of Yajuj Majuj. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, Describe it to me exactly. The man said, It is dark color, it is a dark colored wall that has one side that is black and the other side that is reddish in color. The Prophet wasallam, said, Indeed, you have seen it. Close quote. This is taken from Tafsir Jami' al-Bayan with Ta'wil, volume 16, pages 21 to 23. Now understand, when when bronze, when you heat copper to the point that the bronze happens, that it starts to bronze, that, when it dries, turns a reddish color. And remember, Dhul Qarnayn was pouring that on in layers to strengthen the wall, but to also make it flexible. So we had steel in the wall, but also bronze to make it flexible. Flexible how? Because of weathering. When you build a wall or you build a structure, there's two issues you have to worry about. Erosion and weathering. Now these are both closely related. If you ever want to understand about erosion and weathering, when you paint your house on the outside, especially if it's wood, or if you have new brickwork put in a brand new built house, take pictures of the brickwork every year from a side from a side view, the profile of your house. And as you start to compare pictures, you'll notice 
that there are pockmarks that start to appear in the brickwork. Thinking, subhanAllah, who's poking my bricks? At night, people must be coming by my house with knives or with a hammer and poking the bricks. No, that's from the rain. That's from the hail. That's from ice. That's called weathering. Now, when you keep doing that over a period of time, you keep taking pictures, you'll watch it, you'll also start to notice that the bricks that are exposed to the sun start to lighten up a little bit because they get bleached in the sun. And those that aren't will be darker. And then they start to become a little bit uneven where some of them become loose. What is that? That's erosion. So to help guard against it, you can't, you can't completely stop erosion and weathering, but you can guard against it by reinforcing using steel, but steel is very sturdy. So what happens? It becomes brittle, snaps off. So what do you use? You use bronze, which is what? It's both sturdy, but it's flexible. If you've ever seen bronze or used bronze, it's very flexible. It's more flexible and more durable than copper. This is why people heat it to make it flexible. That's why people, the Chinese, started using it to make bells out of it. So when you ring a bell, in fact, I'll mention this very briefly. There's a show that comes on uh, every Sunday night. It's very late. And it's called, it's called uh, Bells in Britain. And what they do is they take you to different churches throughout the whole of England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And they tell you what the bell is made out of, what it weighs, and how many of them are ringing. Oh, we have a five-weight bell, a seven-weight bell. It's this It's made out of bronze and all these other things. And it gives you a really good understanding because the ringing of the bell, how flexible it is, is the ring that you're going to get when you hit it and the bell shakes and it releases that sound and it will release it over a very large volume of area. That's why people use bronze for bells. They use bronze for all different types of things. They'll use it for, that's why copper, copper is a great superconductor. That's why it's used for wiring and insides and all these other things because it's great for superconducting. It's great for conducting energy. People will wear people will wear copper, right, to try to regulate their blood to keep it to try to keep their blood thin. They'll wear it around their neck to try to keep away infection. There's a lot of wisdom behind a lot of these things. We don't always get it, but there's a lot of wisdom behind these things. So he's using copper and all these other things, and that reddish appearance is a bronzy copper appearance, right? Now we'll quote another historian. Imam Tha'labi, he died 427. He made reference to the wall by saying, quote, Historians have mentioned how the wall was built in these terms. When the measurements were made between the two mountains, Dhul-Qarnayn found that the distance between them was 100 farsakh. When he began the work on the wall, he dug until the base of it reached the water. He made the thickness of the wall to be 50 farsakh and it to be several hands high. He then placed wood between the mountains and put on it iron, and then the wood on the iron. He kept doing this in the order mentioned until the area between the walls was tall, approaching the mountains. He then called for fire and to make it molten, and they continued on until the copper became brass. He, so he placed the fire on the wood that ate it, and the copper took the place of the wood. Then he put the iron with the copper, and the iron became like steel. And finally, real steel, and it was dark in color. It had the shining yellow of the bronze and the red, hot, and black pitch snapping flame of the iron. Once it cooled, it could be seen that the wall was long and enormous indeed. Close quote. This is from Araiso Majalis, pages 325 to 328. So we see that this wall was seen. 
Now, in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, it's mentioned in the text, Fetah Bilad al-Fars. Fetah Bilad al-Fars. Pages 112 and on. That the wall, there were people in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, which was the year 19 of the Hijri, Suraqa ibn Amr had went on a journey. And on his journey, the army had reached an area that had a massive gate. And that gate could not be opened until a number of wars resulted. And after that, they went through the gate and then found an enormous wall that was impassable. The same thing was mentioned by Yaqut in Mu'jam al-Buldan, volume 1, page 305. It was mentioned by one of the traders who came back, Abdul Rahman ibn Rabi'ah, that he returned back and mentioned about an enormous wall that it could not be traversed that had elements of red and black within it and that the wall could not be traversed and that it had been built by a great king long ago and the connection was later made that this king was none other than Dhul-Qarnayn Abdul Rahman ibn Rabi'ah sent forward a messenger of his to look at this wall and the wall resembled a dam. And he said, go back and tell of this event that we have seen because Allah indeed spoke the truth and gave us the truth when he said, so give me the copper and the iron so that it might be heated. Surah Al-Kahf, the 18th Surah 96 to the end of the ayah. We have seen it. And it is to us the better part of what we understand. 100 farsakh in length and large and enormous in height. And it's more advanced than we could have seen the people doing. We also have the Khalifa of the Abbasid Empire, Al Wathiq Billah, sending out people to discover this wall. Al Wathiq Billah bore the name Harun. His birth name was Harun. He became the Khalifa in the year 227 Hijri. He died in the year 232 Hijri. Yaqud said about him in Al Mu'jam, volume 5, page 51. One of the things brought forward was that Al Wathiq Billah saw in a dream that the wall which was built by Dhul Qarnayn between us and between the Yajuj and Majuj could be open. And this terrified him, this dream. And he had it night after night. So he commanded a number of his courtesans to send someone out and to look at the wall and to return back with news about what had happened. Fifty men were commissioned to go forward. And we were each given 5,000 dinar. And he also gave us numerous presents, 100 mules, to carry our provisions and water. We left out 
and made our way until we reached an area and received a letter received a letter from the ruler over Armenia and the ruler of Armenia had the name Butaflis and he helped us and fulfilled our needs and told us we'd had we'd have safe passage to all the other kings and so we carried on until we made our way to an area called Al Khizr and Al Khizr also known as Al Khazar was a far ranging area of a people who we could not understand or grasp their words we saw destroyed buildings and wreckage ruins of what a city had used to be and we thought who did this and we asked the locals who did this and they said you know who did this yet juju met juju did this so we carried on until we reached a fortress near of the mountain which had a massive wall stretching on from it to the next mountain after there on we looked for people and we found some of them speaking arabic and some of them speaking farsi and they were muslims reciting the quran and they had masjids and places to recite so we asked them where did you come from and where did you where did you set off from i informed them i am a messenger of the leader of the believers al wathiq billah and they were astonished by my statements they said the leader of the believers we said yes they said is he a sheikh or a young man we said he's a young man they said where is he we said he's in iraq in a city in the most bountiful city known as sur near rai they said we'd never heard of this before they then came on came across with us and traveled to a mountain called amles and we had no vegetation or anything and our provisions were running low we looked at the wall and saw a massive structure 100 farsakh going across and some 50 hands high or so when we saw this we looked how far it was from where we'd gone to the gate we saw there was copper there was brass in the wall there was steel in the wall we asked about its thickness and we were given answers to our questions and we realized that we were in the lands occupied by the turkic peoples we looked around for the wall or any things that we might see we saw sealed areas of the wall and then we looked if there might be any opening portions in the wall anywhere where we might see that there are any cracks or any holes yet we saw nothing we saw no cracks we saw no holes and we decided to return with this knowledge and inform the leader of the believers of what we had seen close close so they head back saying we found the wall it's there as far as we can tell there's no cracks in it so you must be seeing an event that has not happened yet because we've seen nothing in it yaqut also mentions about arabs living in china around the time of vulqarnain because of the trade routes in his buldan so this has been going on arabs traveling back and forth people living there there's a letter home around 500 bc uh from an arab to his family that mentions the great wall and the construction uh yaqub mentions this in his text mujam al buldan so all these all these things that we see have been established So people have seen this wall. They've witnessed it from BC up until now. So let's talk about our third point. 
Our third point is the dam or the wall of Yajuj and Majuj is routinely attacked by them. So these people aren't just satisfied to have a big dam or wall built up, put behind it and told, now sit behind here and do nothing. No, they routinely attack this wall and try to exit out from it. How do we know this? Let's look at some narratives. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Indeed, yet Juj and Majuj every day dig through the wall until they almost see the rays of the sunshine coming through the hole that they made. Their leader says to them, Return to your places. You will resume digging the following day. When they return, they find the wall stronger than it had been beforehand. This shall continue to happen every day until the time nears for them. And Allah, mighty and majestic, desires for them to be sent forth against the people. They will dig until they almost see the rays of the sun cutting through the hole in the wall. Their leader will say to them, return to your homes. You will resume digging tomorrow if Allah wills. When they return the following day, they find the wall just as had been left with the hole and dig through it and exit out against the people. They will drink the waters of wherever they pass through and the people shall seek refuge in their fortresses. Now understand this then, this hadith. So the first time someone says, their leader says, we'll come back tomorrow if Allah wills, inshallah. Because he did what's known as istithna, he mentioned Allah's name that one time. We'll come back, we'll dig again tomorrow, inshallah. All the other time they've been doing this digging. Every day they do this. That one time that they say that their leader says, inshallah, we'll come back again. That's going to be the day that that hole will stay as it is. And they'll come back, they'll tunnel through and they'll reach the waters. Remember, the foundation of that wall or that dam goes so far down that there's water there. So they're going to drink, their numbers are so great, they're going to drink that water as they're coming out and burrowing through. So they're tunneling through there. Every day they come back, they tunnel back through. Every day they come back, they try to tunnel back through. So this is also another thing that makes it different to the Great Wall of China because the Great Wall of China is built to keep opponents out above ground. That's what the Great Wall is there for. The Radam or the Sed of the Yajuj and Majuj. No, no, no. It's to keep them out over ground, but it's also to keep them burrowing through and burrowing under. So it's greater than a wall. That's why it's referred to sometimes as a radam, as a dam, and sometimes as, as a sed, as a barrier. The hadith continues. Then Yajuj and Majuj shall launch one of their arrows into the sky, and it shall return back to them with something resembling blood. They will say, we have already overcome the people of earth, and now just the people of the sky remain, and we shall ascend and reach them. So understand, they will move around in, about in the earth with swiftness, and overwhelm and terrify the Muslims. And when they're doing this, the, they will then launch some type of arrow. It says something like B.C. Hamihim, something like their arrow and something resembling blood will come back. We don't know what that is yet because we haven't seen this event. It says something resembling blood will come back. And they'll say, well, we've already overwhelmed the people of the earth. Now we're going to go to the skies and overwhelm them. Allah shall then send against them a disease like wormwood that shall infect them at the base of their necks. And it shall be the matter that kills them. By the one in whose hand is my soul. Indeed, the beast of the earth shall rejoice in thanksgiving at the consumption of their flesh and blood. This is collected by Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal in the Musnad, volume 9, pages 521 to 522. So this means that the carcasses of these, of these two tribes, their carcass will be so plentiful, the amount that have died, that the animals will rejoice because there's that much flesh and meat to, to be consumed, there's that much blood and meat that the animals will rejoice at the carcasses, the vulture, the raccoon, all your scavenger animals that are going to be consuming their leftovers, their cadavers, their carcass. They will rejoice at the fact of 
them having so much to consume. So the Yajuj and Majuj, this shall ultimately be their end. Now, you say, well, what about the Hadith and the Sahih from Muslim and Al-Bukhari where Nabi Isa Islam makes dua and this comes to them? Yes, this is connected to next week where we wrap everything up. But we're talking about the end of Yajuj and Majuj, these Ahadith separating out Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Because remember, they're contemporaries to one another. So the Yajuj and the Majuj, their ultimate end comes at that point when that disease like wormwood. Wormwood is like tapeworm. Wormwood. It's like tapeworm. So it's something in the base of the neck, like wormwood, tapeworm that will overwhelm them. And they'll be completely destroyed. Right, so if you've ever seen someone with a really serious, if you do some research and look up uh, tapeworm infection, not having a tapeworm, tapeworm infection or tapeworm infestation. The infestation of tapeworm is so serious they've opened people up and just worms have just gushed out. So we now come to number two. The second hadith under our third section, the dam or wall of the Ajuja Majuja is routinely attacked by them. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu said, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, The wall shall be opened and yet Jujim and Juj shall exit out just as Allah said, And they shall sweep down from every high place. Sultan Anbiya, the 21st surah, ayah 96. So we see that yet Jujim and Juj, they sweep down from every high place. The Central Asian steps where the Turkish pe Turk Turkic peoples come from is on a step. It's called the Central Asian Step. It's high up. So they have to come down from where they are to do what they do. So they will sweep down from every high place because they're not from lowland areas. They're not from grasslands. Turkic peoples aren't from Africa. They're not from these other areas. They're from st a step, S-T-E-P-P-E. -E. A step is a highland area. They come from there. And they'll sweep down. Then the Prophet ﷺ goes on to say, They shall surge out among the people, and the people will flee to their cities and fortresses. The two tribes shall set upon the people and besiege their thoroughfares. Okay, the thoroughfares means where the people normally go about. Your streets, your alleyways, when people walk on their country lanes. So the places where people might normally walk and take their solace, parks, those are called thoroughfares, where there's their normal foot traffic, day-to-day -to -day foot traffic of people, they'll be there waiting. And they'll overwhelm the people on their thoroughfares. So the people will have to take refuge in their homes and in fortresses. The Prophet ﷺ goes on to say, they will go through the lands and drink the waters of the lands they pass through until some of them will pass by that river and another among them will say, there was water here once, but now no more. Now this tells you there's such a huge amount of people that they're literally consuming as they're going along. Now I want to touch on one thing. It will be mentioned next week, but I'll mention it shortly now. One of the advocates saying that the yeah, Juj and Juj are the Jews that are in Israel. They say because they're pumping water from the Sea of Galilee or, the, or Lake Tiberias. And Lake Tiberias' water level is going down. And because of that, they're like the yeah, Juj and Juj. I want you to do a research tonight. This will be your second research. It's called, the research is called Lake Tiberius Water Levels. And you will find that the pumping that the children of Israel are doing in Lake Tiberius isn't depleting the water levels because there's annual reduction and increase every year. So the lake, because of erosion and weathering, will lose some of its volume and then gain it back. What the Israeli government is being spoken to about is pumping water outside of the water limits that they've agreed to the international community. But it has nothing to do with them going by 
and drinking all the water and nothing left because the children of Israel, there's more Jews in New York than there are in the state of Israel. If you go to Manhattan and you stay in Manhattan, you will see more Jews in Manhattan than you ever have in your life than if you go to Israel. There's far more there in Manhattan, just Manhattan, New York City. There's more Jews there than in Israel. They are not that numerous. So this idea that they're them, it's, this is completely foolishness. Because Lake Tiberias is within its threshold limit for water reduction and an increase. So if you do your homework, you'll see that that is the case. We continue on with the hadith of the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. They will move out among the people and they will find that the people have fled to the cities or the fortified areas. The Ajuj and Ajuj will then say, these are the people of the earth. We have dispensed with them and nothing remains but to conquer the people of the sky. One of them shall take a spear and hurl it towards the sky. The spear shall return to them covered in the blood on account of the great test and tribulation. Now, so understand, so the spear returns to them covered in blood on account of the great test and tribulation. So it's not necessarily that they killed someone in the sky, but it's the great test and the tribulation. That time, this is a symbol. It's a metaphor of that time shall be a time of such great tribulation, the like of which hasn't been seen these times. Because remember, Yajuj Majuj, you have Al-Masih Al-Dajjal, the false Messiah appearing. Yajuj Majuj appearing. Then you have Nabiul Isa alayhi salam. You have Al Imam al Mahdi alayhi salam. All these events and personalities are occurring in close proximity to each other. They're contemporaneous. That's a time the like of which we've never seen before. So the Prophet وسلم, goes on to say, When the matter is like this, Allah shall send a disease among them, upon them, that affects the base of their necks, and worms shall exit out from them. The morning shall come upon them. And they shall all be dead without a sound being made by them. The Muslims will say, Is there not a man among us that can suffice himself and find out what has been done with the enemy? Abu Sa'id al-Khudri goes on to quote the Prophet A man among them who is careful shall go out for such a long period of time that he shall be thought to be dead and will go down and find the Yajuj and Majuj dead piled on top of each other. He will then call out, Assembly of Muslims, shall you not rejoice? Indeed, Allah has sufficed you of your enemy. The Muslims will exit from their cities and fortifications and rejoice at their affair. There shall not be any place except that their flesh shall be found and the beasts of the earth shall rejoice in it like the best soil from which vegetation could be grown. So, this hadith is collected by Imam Zahmed ibn Hanbal in the Musnad, Ibn Hibban in the Sahih, Ibn Majin in the Sunan, and Al Hakim in the Mustadrak. So what that means is the animals shall rejoice just like a fertile soil that gives forward good vegetation. So the animals that will break down their bodies, that will consume them, they'll be rejoicing in this. Right? Then we have the final statement. Statement four. Statements four and five, excuse me. The final two statements. Has the wall or dam of Yajuj and Majuj been breached and have they exited? Zaynab bin Jahsh anha, narrated that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, woke up terrified one day with a red face and said, There is no God but Allah. Woe be to the Arabs of an evil. The time has neared today where the Yajuj and Majuj have opened a portion of the wall the size of this here. And he took his thumb and index finger and made a circle. Zaynab bin, Zaynab bin Jahsh Anha said, Messenger of Allah, will we be destroyed although among us are pious people? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, Yes, when filth spreads. This is collected by Imam Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari in al-Jami of Sahih, Book of Tribulations in the chapter of Yajuj Majuj, as well as Muslim ibn al-Hajjaj. So we have here then the Arabs are being warned of an evil that will strike them. That will strike them. Now, scholars such as scholars such as Ibn Kathir, Al-Qurtubi, and others have said that 
the tribulation of the Tatars coming upon the Muslims, particularly the Arabs, was a foretaste of the type of tribulation we'll see with the release of Yajuj and Majuj. It was a foretaste. So the Prophet Sallallahu saying this, the Yajuj and Majuj have opened a portion of the wall the size of this here. It's referring back to that. They're digging every day and everything else. The Tatars coming and destroying Baghdad, <clears throat> then reaching other areas and devastating those areas. That is a portent of yet Juj and Majuj is coming. Right, so he woke up scared. He saw a vision and warned the Arabs of this, that something would come upon them. The fifth and final point is Hajj and Umrah will still be made while yet Juj and Majuj are in the earth. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrated that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said People will be making the Hajj and Umrah While yet Juj and Majuj are in the earth This is collected by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal In Al-Musnad volume 10 pages 87 88 So we see then that Yet Juj and Majuj won't be stopping people from making Hajj and Umrah in that way Because people will be fleeing to built up areas and fortify fortifications Well Mecca and Al-Madinah are built up areas and fortifications. So they won't be stopping people from making the Hajj and the Umrah. They'll, it'll be happening while they're in the earth. While they're in the very earth. I say all that to say this. There are some five points that we're going to be looking at next week. If Allah preserves us. The first is. There are a number of ahadith. Which I've only seen partial quotations in English. I'm not sure if they've been quoted fully in English. But partial ahadith quoted in English. About Nabiuna Isa alayhi salam. Al-Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. And yet Juj and Majuj. And that there's a connection between them. This will be mentioned. This is the first thing. The second thing is, is the battle of the great tribulation. This is another event that is going to occur. I didn't quote it today because it's not yet connected. It's called the battle of the great tribulation. And it shall be a battle the like of which has not been seen before. In terms of the devastation that shall be done. So the, gra the battle of the great tribulation. So the battle of the great tribulation will be covered. Number three. The third thing we'll want to discuss next week. Will be the victory of righteousness over wickedness. The victory of righteousness over wickedness. So the end of the system that we understand, that we currently live under, this system of wickedness, a time is coming in which there will be no democracy. There will be no atheism. There will be no congregationalism. There will be no socialism or communism. This is all coming to an end. Because it's all part of this wicked system. And this wicked system is coming to an end. <clears throat> the fourth point to cover will be dealing with matters after Nabiuna Isa alayhi salam and some of the final signs. And then number five. Number five will deal with the state of people at that time. Inshallah, the week after next, we'll be dealing with the cool wind that comes when the Muslims are raptured from the earth. And no one will remain except for those who are not Muslim. That is the complete total summation of the signs of the end of time and then the major signs before the day of resurrection. This has to do with something in the Quran that Allah has called his Kaid, his Mekr, his Qadr, which means his plan. 
once we get through all of this, especially when we come to signs of end of time and we wrap up the cool wind and these other things, you'll see that Allah has set up all of this in an elaborate, systematic, contained plan, which was to show his holiness, his power, his wisdom, his might, and his glory. And this all wraps up perfectly and all the loose ends get tied up. To understand the signs at the end of time is to understand Allah the Exalted's salvation plan for humanity. All of this goes back to the discussion of salvation. Who's saved and who's not. Who's lost for all eternity and who's not. So for the Muslim, he believes in Allah's plan. No Muslim believes in heaven or hell. The Muslim believes in the paradise and the fire. Now, initially, some of us might flinch because we've been through Christian schooling. So some of us think that Jannah and heaven means the same thing as hell, and, but we don't. If you read the Bible in the New Testament, you look at Hades and Sheol, and then you read in the Quran about the fire that Allah has promised, they couldn't be more different. And the paradise and heaven, they couldn't be more different. But because we've gone through Kafir education system, if we haven't deprogrammed, we, we, use, we use Christian terminology similarly. We say Jesus, they say Jesus. We say John, they say John. Without realizing the theological circumstances of this. We're using another religion's terminology. And then when Christianity gets undermined or knocked down using the same religious attacks, then we become angry in the same way and respond the same way that Christians would. Because we've imbibed their theology. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not saying you're a Catholic. What I'm saying is you've taken the same language of terminology, the theological terminology that they've taken and attached Islam to it as if it's part of the same religion. And it is not. So... This is part of what we'll see in the signs of the end of time is Allah's plan of salvation for those who believe is part of a much bigger plan that he has for the human race and for everyone else. And once it comes together, you'll understand the type of Lord that we serve, the type of God that we worship, a holy, righteous, sovereign Lord that is master over everything. And that all of this comes together with his wisdom. So, with all that being said, my concluding statement is that it has been, I say this in the run-up to it because I have hope, inshallah, that we will complete it. Thus far, it has been an absolute pleasure to have gone through uh, these signs. It's been exhilarating. It's been terrifying. It's been many different things. But to show, to be able to show after the tefsir class where Allah has showed his plan, this is what my plan looks like. And then to also show the same thing in the ahadith and the ayat and the other literature has been a very exciting endeavor, the like of which I'd hoped that I'd live to be able to do. And I've been able to live this far to do it and so I'm very excited about completing this and being able to now turn it over and have you look through the prism and see, ah, yes, this is the plan that Allah set up. And the most important parts of it for us to know, we now understand and we know. So the questions that we would have, we no longer have. And the questions that are no good to us or we shouldn't have, we no longer have. Because we understand what we need to know and we understand what is of no benefit for us to know. Or one of the few times I'll borrow U.S. military language, information is disseminated on a need-to-know basis. So you are given the information that you need to know. And the information that you do not need to know you are given the response, information is disseminated on a need-to-know basis. 
So I say Yaqula Kawli Hada Stafirullah Li Walakum Astaghfirullah in the Allah Ghafur Rahim. Are there questions over what we've covered so far today? Yes. Okay, so the question is on page four. The barrier of the Ajuj Majuj is said to be bigger than the Great Wall and more sturdy. Which Great Wall is this referring to? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. This is referring to the Great Wall, the, the wall of the Chinese, the wall that they have, because their wall is called a Sadal Adam or a Sadal Adim, the, the, the massive wall. I put Great Wall because it's easily understandable. So it refers to that. Yes? Any other question? Yes. Um, on page five, page five. Uh, the hadith is narrated by Imam Abu Jafar Muhammad uh, Ibn Jalil Zabri, where it says, um, what, where it says the man who saw the wall, he said one side of it was black and the inside was reddish in color. Does that mean he was on both sides of the wall? Okay. So the question is <coughs> number number five, uh, page number five, that the man said. The man who saw the wall said to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was a dark colored wall that has one side that is black and one side that is reddish uh, in color. Uh, does this mean that he saw both sides of the wall? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. No, rather, because he's talking about the wall that's 100 farsakh, there's one side that's black and one side that's red because he has to, he's over, he overlaid it with bronze and everything else. So, as you're looking at the wall, you can see that one side of it's a blackish color and one side of it's sort of reddish and bronze. You can see it sort of fades into different colors. Yes. Yes. Because we've known now that people have seen this wall, um, and whenever they mention that they saw the wall, it's huge, it's unmissable, it's unmistakable that it's a wall. Why, in recent times, haven't we heard of people being able to see it or people being able to locate it? Is there, any, is there any reason or has it become hidden? Okay, so the question is, because the wall has been seen as being very large and unmistakable, why is it that it's not been made reference to in more recent times? Has the wall become hidden or is some other uh, matter taking place? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Well, Imams Muhammad al-Tabakh and others mentioned that this wall or dam, it's become incorporated into the wall that's called the Great Wall of China. As we remember, the Great Wall of China, it's it's not one wall. It has been a series of walls, and it's larger in some areas than other areas. Some areas are bigger than other areas. Some areas are demolished. Some areas are black. Some areas are red. Some areas are blackish and red. So that whole thing, it's connected to all that. And there's parts of it that are bigger than the others. Now, could that be the dam? Those parts that are big? Well, we'd have to dig down there to know for sure. So the fact that people haven't reported back is most likely to do with the fact that it's the, the, the actual dam has been incorporated into the wall, that whole expanse in such a way that it now seems as seamlessly. So if you ask someone from the English speaking world or people who are English speaking that haven't looked at the history in a detailed manner if you ask them about the great wall they think that it was a contiguous wall that was built at one time in history or it took a long time to build and it's just one contiguous wall it's not it's a series of walls that have been built over and over again and the radam or the other wall wound up being incorporated in it because you can see photos online of the wall and it's and it showed i can't remember the the body of war it said the wall terminating at the sea and it just shows the wall stopping, the end of a beach, and then the expanse of the ocean. And like, that's where the wall stopped. And then it shows another place where it's in Gandong and it's way up like in a hillock. And it's like another portion of a wall. So that wall is going across the whole area, right? So it may, it's, it's most likely the case that that radam, that dam has been included within it. And, 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 and subsumed within it to the point to where, and with weathering over time and everything else, and the fact that they've put mortar over the walls and everything, it's probably been incorporated in, in which it looks like it's just one thing now. 
Well, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, two questions. The first one, you know, uh, for point five, uh, you know. What uh, page five? Uh, point five, page eight. Page eight, point five. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, so does that mean that you uh, you bridge my doors? I'm going to come up here when it's hash time. And the second part of the question is, does that mean that Makkah's going to be unaffected by your judgment Jewish whilst they're on the earth? Okay, so the so there's two questions regarding page 8.5 about Hajj and Umrah being made while Yajuj and Majuj are in the earth. So the first question is, does this mean that Yajuj and Majuj will emerge and come out at a time in which it will be Hajj and Umrah season? And number two, does this mean Mecca and Medina will be unaffected uh, by them? Alhamdulillah, salatu alhamdulillah. The answer to the first question is, I'm not sure because... We don't know exactly how many years yet Juj and Majuj will be moving in the earth. It may be that they emerge during Hajj and Umrah time. It may be that they don't, but that while they're in the earth, Hajj and Umrah time come. And for the duration of earth, it may mean that they're there for a number of years, that people keep doing Hajj and Umrah while they're still moving in the earth. Secondly, um, yet yeah, Juj and Majuj are not affecting Mecca and Al-Medina. Um, it's mentioned that the Dajjal will not be entering into these places. But we don't have a hadith one way or another about Yajuj entering in or not. Um, so we can't say for a surety that Yajuj and Majuj won't go in there. We can't say that they will either though, because we don't have a definite declaration. We know where they're going, the area that they're taking, and they wind up at Dabiq or A'maq, they wind up there. But we don't know if along the way they cut through and go to Hijaz and those other areas. We we're, that we we can't say for a surety. People have tried to infer, but we don't know for a surety. So that's all I can say for the second uh, question. So, so does that mean that the entire time that they're on the earth, that Hajj and Umrah can still be made? Yeah, still can, still carrying on because, and that's the powerful thing about the Hadith is that is that the Hadith is also in a. a um, it's in an emphasized form. Like people will surely be making, right? They will definitely be making the Hajj and the Umrah while they're in the earth. It means that they're continuing. It's definitely carrying on while it's happening. So it's still carrying on. Now, does that mean that there will be uh, there won't be disruptions? Because when when the Tatar, which were from the same Turkic peoples, when they came, Hajj carried on, although. Her jaj got killed along the way, or during their travels on the way to Hajj, but it never stopped. It just carried on, even though her jaj and other people got killed. They still, it still continued. Right. Well, yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. So if there's no further questions, we will close here, and then next week, inshallah, our job is we have the beginning of our summation. So next week is our summation, and then the week after that is the epilogue where we wrap everything up and then we're going to talk about a few things there thereafter so we say subhanak allahumma wa hamdika wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik innahu ghafurur rahim ar-rahim wa la ilaha illa allah wassalamu alaykum